City View Church. How are you today? Welcome, welcome, welcome. Glad you're here today. If you are new with us for the, for the, for the first time, my tongue's not working immediately. Uh, you should have gotten a handout on the way in. On that handout, there's a little tear-off dealy do. Uh, we would love to get a record of your visit. We do not bombard you with email. We aren't spammers. Uh, we would just love a record of your visit on the back side of it. We also we always like to point this out as well. There's a prayer. There's a prayer section for that. We take seriously prayer at City View Church, so we pray for every request that comes through. Our elders pray. Our uh, prayer team prays. Our staff prays. I, I would really be thankful for you to share those things that are going on in your heart, on in your mind, uh, that that we can pray for, so we can follow up with. We take it very seriously. It is a big deal for us. Uh, second little announcement before we get going. Uh, we are having a new member class today. Uh, if you are going to stay for that, meet me in the back there, kind of in the interest of this hall. There's a little City View sign there. You can meet with me back there, and then I will walk you to the classroom we're going to be in. Uh, we do that because uh, it's hard to get back there, and I want to, you know, I don't want you to get lost and end up playing the tuba. That'd be weird. Uh, anybody paying attention out there? All right. Um, uh, and if you're new and you're like, you know, I don't, I'd like to know a little bit more about the church, but I don't want to become a member. I just want to like set that at ease. Uh, the new member class, at the end of it, you do not become a member at City View Church. That We have a little process that follows after that. This kind of just shares with you what being a member is about, uh, why membership's important, uh, what, why, why City View would ask you to become a member. So, that, so that's going on today. If you want to stay after, hey, we didn't sign up, that's fine. We have extra food for you. If you have kids, we've got child care for you. We would just love to invite you over to that at the end of uh, the service today. Uh, you have found us in the middle of a series called Gospel Filter. We are examining some of those, uh, th those hot-button issues that, that are all over our society today. Uh, somebody asked me today, uh, did we plan to do like stair-stepping them up? Like we started with technology where everybody's kind of like, yeah, there's probably a tech problem. We got we to gotta figure that thing out. And then we talked, then we moved up a level to, to race. Then we moved up one more level to, uh, to the Me Too movement. And now we're taking one, one more giant step up, one step for uh, uh, mankind, I suppose. And we're going to be talking through the LGBTQIA plus issue uh, as, as, we, as we continue the series. Uh, today. I want to, the series has been, I've really enjoyed preaching it. I've enjoyed kind of showing, hopefully, hopefully this has been good. We, we, we've showed, we, we don't need to view these things as Republicans and conservatives. We don't need to view these things as, uh, as Democrats or liberals. And, th and that means we don't need to view them either as independent parties. But what we need to view these things as is Christians. We need to view these, these issues, every issue in life, through the lens, through the filter of the gospel. I got the idea for this series when I was going to, the, to my to eye doctor. And, and what you end up doing there is it, they, they put something in front of you. I can't read. My vision's terrible. And they, they flash a little, uh, little dealy do in front of you. They go, one or two, which, which lens? Two or three, which lens? Three or four, which lens? And, and as the, the filter changes, you're able to see the thing in front of you more clearly. My proposition for this whole series is that what sin has done is it has caused our vision to be blurry. The, the, the sin, the original sin that indwells every human being has caused our vision to be blurry about those things that are right in front of us. And uh, what we need is a calibration back to what the gospel would have us uh, to see. So I feel like I'm, I'm accomplishing this mission. I, I felt really good this week. I got, I got two separate emails. They watched the, the message on race. Both of them did. Uh, one of them called me. I want to get it right. I can't use all the words they used. Um, and it's nobody who goes to church here. It's somebody, you know, they're, they're out of state. They just, they just saw it online. They, I don't know how they found it, but they did. Uh, one person called me uh, a conservative operative. Sure. 
like that somehow I'm part of a vast conservative conspiracy that's undermining blah, 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 blah. I won't read you that whole email. And then somebody else called me on the other side of the issue, a, a liberal, well, I mean, this is in the King James Version, so I can say it, a liberal jackass. That, if you're like, oh, you can't say that, uh, that was in the Bible, older <laughs> versions, don't get over, get over that. Um, because uh, th- that was actually probably the meanest email. <laughs> oh, I, was, I was not expecting not expecting that level of vitriol. But I feel like if, I'm, if we're angering both sides, we're probably doing okay. <laughs> because the plan, the hope, is to help us see things through the gospel. And, and what that means, I mean, I, I just think back to the words of Jesus in the, in the, uh, when, he's, when he's preaching there, is, is that we need to be walking a narrow road. That we need to be walking a road that is significantly different than what our world says is right and wrong. That, that, this, that this road we're on following Jesus is different. It's called us to be something brand new. And so today we're, we're diving right in to, to maybe the hottest button topic until next week when we're talking politics. That'll be exciting. I can't wait to get the emails after that one. That's going to be fun. Um, I feel like frequently Christians are too easily known for the things that we are against rather than the things that we are for. Does that make sense? We, we come to that because so frequently we're kind of, these things are placed in front of us in terms of political issue. And so you're either voting for or against a topic. And so what ends up happening with, with Christians is we, we kind of get Mm, pigeonholed into this idea that we're for this thing or against this thing. Now, we're going to separate the whole idea of politics out of this today, and we're not talking about voting, not voting. We're not talking about any of that. We're going to talk about how we view uh, people, how we talk through people, how we deal with people. Um, and, And because we're a people who are so frequently known by what we're against, by the policy we might be against or the policy that, that we might be voting in, in, in accord with, uh, others view a policy vote and say, well, you're against me. Does that make sense? Or, that's being really charitable to Christians, okay? <laughs> That, that's being kind to the household of faith. Like, you know, we vote for something and, you know, they, they, say, we, they say we vote for something and they're like, okay, well, neat. Uh, you're against me. Too frequently, we take our political position, boil it down to be the essence or really the identity of who we are, and we neglect the idea that the gospel should be in the center. And I think there's probably no bigger issue where that's happened than with the LGBTQ community, where Christians have come out strongly opposed to multiple issues dealing with the LGBTQ community. And have more frequently than not been characterized correctly as not loving your neighbor. And so I want to call Christians to, to an understanding to say, hey, we, we've got to get back to understanding people as people. We've got to get back to understanding of understanding how Jesus would have us view people. And call Christians to an understanding of our identity being found not in our political position, 
the thing we're for, the thing we're against, but their identity be found in the gospel. That, that, that a Christian is not primarily an American or a Texan or, uh, or a, even a man or a woman, that a Christian primarily, the, the thing you are primarily as a Christian is a believer in Jesus Christ. Does that make sense? That, that if we're going to get down to the foundation of who we are, it is Jesus Christ has saved us. And from there, we, we, go, we build up. From there, we understand our position in society, our, our, our citizenship in, in the United States, our citizenship in the great Republic of Texas, uh, the, the real country that we all live in. And, and, and we understand that deal. And I want to call... our LGBTQ friends, and those, let me say this, before I get to that. If somehow you think that the environments you're in don't have those who struggle with these issues, even inside of church, or your Facebook friends, or whatever, you, you are sorely mistaken. This, this, this affects everywhere, all swaths, and, uh, and frankly, I feel like the church owes the, the church in general owes the LGBT community kind of a, a, a general apology in, in that we have not cared for a community well. And so what I, but there, but there is a, a problem here. There, 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 is a, there is a problem with this, because I've asked myself, are, are, is the Christian sex ethic, the way that we talk about sex as believers in Jesus, based on what the Bible has to say, is the Christian sex ethic, is that wrong? Have, have, have we just misinterpreted it and gotten it all wrong? You know, the, the, the classic Christian sex ethic is man marries wife. That's the place where sex is supposed to happen only in the confines of that. And so I've got to ask myself a question. Is, is that correct or not? Is that, is that true or not? And so I went back through a, a ton of scripture, did a ton of research, got through all of this stuff. This has really been a, a, a topic that I've been studying for at least two years now to get to the kind of the, the edge of where it is. Is our Christian sex ethic wrong? And I would say No. Our Christian sex ethic is correct. But I'll say this. The way Christians practice their sex ethic is wrong. Does that make sense? So, so the way that we understand what marriage and sexuality should be classically is correct. The problem is identity. And when it comes down to it for all of us, that, that, that's really the, the, the big issue overall, the identity that we're dealing with. Christians need to find their identity in the gospel. We all need to find our identity in who Jesus says we are. And let, 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 let's just get to this first statement because I think this says it best. I want our identity, I, I hope that what we can talk about today is that our identity is dictated by our Savior, not our sexuality. The thing that I want to get to today, the point, the large point I want to make today is that our identity, our identity is dictated by a Savior, not our sexuality. Um, I, I've done a lot of, I've got, I could give you multiple resources. If you want a lot of resources. I would love to pour them out on you today. Uh, I, I have one specifically that, that I've mentioned at the end uh, by an author named Rosaria Butterfield. It's called The Secret Thoughts of an Unlikely Convert, An English Professor's Journey into the Christian Faith. 
Uh, that doesn't really say it all. She was an LGBTQ activist. She was an English PhD at the University of Syracuse. Uh, and she started exploring the claims of Christianity. She read about Christianity. She started interacting with a, with a faithful pastor who loved her and loved Jesus and understood where she was at and was faithful to, to the scripture and was faithful to the text, but also faithful to loving it, the, the person in front of her. And, and she uh, trusted in Jesus and she came out of the out of the lifestyle. She saw it as it was, as the Bible says it is, and saw a Christian who didn't judge her for it, but loved her. And held the scripture tightly and held loving her tightly. And that, I just summed up the book for you so you don't really have to read it. Um, there's another author out there. His name is Preston Sprinkle. You'll never forget that name. It's the weirdest name ever. Uh, he has done, he's devoted his ministry over the last five years to this specific issue. He's a PhD uh, who's, who's written his dissertation on this issue, uh, traveling widely, explaining things widely. He's got a lot of courses and things we might be engaging in the future because I really think he's going to be helpful in the way that uh, churches start to understand this issue and talk about this issue in, in the broader context. Um, and, and one of the things that he talks about is that the key issue that we're dealing with when it comes to any of this, and I, and I find it to be really true, is, is the issue of identity. Christians need to find it in the gospel. Those in the LGBTQ community need to find it in the gospel. That, that our identity is the key issue here. And so frequently, what our society tells us is that our identity is actually intrinsically linked to our sexuality. And I would just flatly say that your identity is not linked to your sexuality. Jason, are you going to tell me that all homosexuals are going to, going to hell? No, because I'm not going to tell you that all heterosexuals are going to heaven. That's become one of the little, one of the little uh, side things that, that, that's kind of been hooked into Christianity. That, well, they're against, they're against homosexuality, so that means they're completely for heterosexual sex. They're, that's totally fine. And that, that's just not true. Wait, we're against that? <laughs> There's one place where sex is acceptable, where sex is designed by God. There's one place, one place, one place. That's in the confines of marriage between a man and a woman. One place where God says yes. Sexual immorality of any kind, heterosexual sex of any kind outside of marriage is wrong. All right, that is sin. Homosexual relationships. That is sin. There's one path. It's a narrow path, and it's a hard path. I'm going to walk us through four points. We're going to drop down a gospel filter from the scripture, and then we're going to walk through four more points to kind of see the other side of it. And then we'll, we'll roll on, and I'll get a bunch of emails. You guys ready? When we allow our sexuality to dictate our identity, we allow our politics to pastor us. When we allow our sexuality to dictate our identity, we allow our politics to pastor us. We let our favorite writer or activist lead us. We let them say, this is what I think, this is what I do. We let Sean Handy or Rachel Maddow be the ones who tell us how we should feel about a specific issue. We let Rush Limbaugh, we, we let Anderson Cooper decide. And frankly, those aren't the authorities in your life. Like, if you want, who's the authority at City View Church? It's not Jason, it's your elders. But the great authority in your life is, is Jesus Christ. And who does Jesus say we are? And what does Jesus say about a specific issue? Mm. So frequently, we let the loudest voice be the one that speaks for us. Because they're yelling. 
Because if they're yelling so loudly and they're on TV or radio or they're writing the big column, if they're writing that, they must know more than me. And if they're doing that, then okay that. And I generally agree with them. But when we allow our sexuality to dictate our identity, we're going to allow our politics to pastor us. The way that we feel about a specific issue to say, okay, that's the way we feel about a specific party to be the, the basis by which we live our lives. Frankly, that's unhealthy. Number two, when we allow our sexuality to dictate our identity, we demonize those who sin differently. I think in recent years, in the fight for the family, which I think is an important overall fight, in, our, in the Christian fight for the family, uh, one of the things that we've ended up doing is we have elevated homosexuality, LGBTQ community. We've elevated this issue, this sin, to be the unpardonable sin. Where <laughs> they, can't, they can't trust Jesus. Ooh, we're just going to fight against all of that. And what I'm going to say really clearly is it's not the unpardonable sin. We've elevated it to this level that is not scriptural, that is not biblical, that is not correct. The unpardonable sin is not believing in Jesus. That, that that's what it ends up being. So you know how you overcome the unpardonable sin? trust in Jesus. So frequently we've said we, we've got we've to fix them and then once we fix them, then they can trust Jesus. But that's not the way it's ever worked for anybody throughout the entirety of Christianity. The way all of this works, the way Christianity works is not, you, it is not clean up and then come to Jesus. It's we're all dirty, rotten, terrible sinners and Jesus cleans us up. That was good. You should say amen to that. I even got louder, crescendoed. Gosh, you guys are just like, what's he going to say? I don't know if I can agree or disagree. We are all dirty, disgusting sinners in and of ourselves. It's what we are. It's It's what original sin has done to all of us. And you know what original sin has done to all of us? Is it's given us proclivities to different sides of of, of the sin spectrum. Some scholars call this a besetting sin that different people struggle with. So some, it's greed. And others, it's it's pornography. And, and, And others, it's anger. Or it's pride. And others... homosexuality. And the, what original sin has done to all of us, it has poisoned us. And the thing is, what we end up doing really frequently is demonizing those who sin differently than us. There's a lot of understanding for people who sin like you. Or, or, I get why it's like that. Oh, it's, I'm, I'm sorry for that. It's too bad. I'm sorry you struggle with anger. I also struggle with anger. It's okay. Jesus forgives. But when it comes to a sin that you don't struggle with, then it's real easy to become a Pharisee about the whole thing. It's real easy to say, if you don't struggle with anger, you see somebody struggling with anger, what's wrong with that guy? Rather than understanding the sinner, separated from God who needs redemption through the blood of Jesus. We let our uh, sexuality dictate our identity. We demonize those who sin differently. Number three, when we allow our sexuality to dictate our identity, we believe that the world, we believe the world, not its creator. Some of the clearest conversation about all of this is kind of summed up in, in, in this three-word phrase that I'm sure you hear a lot. It, 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 it's, it's the phrase, 
love is love. Have you heard that on, on news? Have you heard that throughout? Love is love. Love is love. Love is love. When, when we're allowing our sexuality to, to dictate who we are, to dictate our identity, when we're letting that happen, then we're not listening to what the creator of the universe had to say. We're not listening to the way God ordered it all. We're not listening to, to here is God, here is the one who made it, here's the one who shaped it with his hands, who, who it, the Bible says, holds it in the palm of his hand. He, here, here's the one who made it all, ordered it all, created it all. We're deciding, no, this is how I feel. And when we do that, we elevate our feelings to be God. It's not just in this homosexual LGBTQ conversation that this happens. We do it in all areas of our lives. It, 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 ha it happens all over the place where we allow a certain sin because that's just the way God made me. That, that, that's just the way God, God created me to be. I, and, and so I, I just have to deal with it. I've heard this one specifically anger. This is the one where, you know, angry guy flies off the handle. Angry guy flies off the handle. He knows he's doing the wrong thing. He knows he shouldn't be acting the way he is. And then he feels kind of bad about it, apologizes to the person that, that he's flown off the handle on. And then when he flies off, the, the, then he doesn't really repent. He just says he's sorry, and then it's over with. Until the next time he flies off the handle, he doesn't really care. He just, you know, whatever. And then says, that's just how God made me. I'm just that way. I don't know if you've ever done any personality tests. Anybody ever do these uh, Myers-Briggs, DISC profile, new one called the Enneagram? Uh, and a lot of these places, uh, when I take these, it's always like, I get these weird. So on the Myers-Briggs, I'm an ENTJ, which, which means... Uh, Here's who else throughout history was an ENTJ. Napoleon, Hitler, Winston Churchill. Those are the examples that are given. One, I saw Steve Jobs. I'm like, oh, that's cool. Everybody wants Hitler to be their pastor. <laughs> I took the disc profile. I showed it to the person who was kind of leading us through the disc profile understanding what it was about and he, he saw my he saw my letters uh, and, and I am a gigantically high D which I you know uh, I'm not gonna tell you what he said it might stand for uh, and I'm a gigantically high D and he, <laughs> he said I've never seen a D that high before <laughs> I said cool and then on the, on the uh, Enneagram, there, that's, that's a number one. I like, I've kind of started to like that one a little bit more. I think it kind of showcases a little bit of, of that. I'm, I'm either a three or an eight on that. At first I thought I was an eight. And, and what an eight is, again, the, the comparison people, Steve Jobs, Hitler, Winston Churchill. <laughs> You're like, you seem so much nicer than them. Thank you. I'm putting words in your mouth. Thank you. But what those profiles frequently end up doing is they categorize you. As they categorize you, they say these are the bents you typically have. And what they end up doing, one of their weaknesses, is as because they have they showcase these bents, as you know, you an A, you're gonna tend towards anger. A D, you're gonna drive hard and you're gonna leave people in your way because you're just leading so hard. What they're doing is showcasing the positives and they're forgetting the negatives. And what the Lord would say to us, I think, in the middle of understanding our personalities, in the middle of understanding the depth of who we are, is that that may be kind of the direction you're going, but it doesn't negate the sin that is created as a result of that. Does that make sense? So if I'm a hard-driving eighth that says, we got to get stuff done, we got to get it done, get it done now, we got to go, we got to go, we got to go, but I roll over people as I'm doing that, it's not... It's sinful for me to roll over people while I'm doing that. Does that make sense? Got, a little, got some blank looks here. We're going we're gonna to delve a little bit further into this. If, if, if I'm somebody who's saying, we've got to accomplish the goal, 
And all that matters is the goal. And we got people who are coming alongside. Hey, we're going to follow you. You're a good leader. We're going to do this thing. We're going to accomplish the goal. We're going after the goal. But in the midst of it, we're destroying other people's faith. We're destroying people and, and, and frankly, just living in our sin. Then that's, that's evil. I can't just say, this is my personality. This is how I'm made. You just got to deal with it. See, I'm, I'm supposed to constantly be conformed to the image of Jesus. Not trying to conform the world to Jason. So that's actually number four. You can write this down. When we allow our sexuality to... Uh, to dictate our identity. We can form Christ to fit our image. We can form others. We try to get others to fit inside of who I am. This is me. Yield to me. This is who I am. Yield to what I have to say. Understand me. Accommodate me. Be proud of me. But what the scripture would say is something different. So what, what we've been trying to do throughout this series is we're going to point out some issues and then we drop down a gospel filter so that maybe we can look at the scripture and we can understand what does the scripture say for us in this instance. So I picked these three verses. We're going to read them, I'm going to explain them, then we're going to move on. When Paul's writing this, he's writing to a, a church in Greece, in Corinth. And this church could properly be be uh, summed up as the, a church gone wild. Everything that you could imagine is going on. They're drunk at the Lord's Supper. You know, like this most holy of communion events that we end up doing, they're coming to it drunk. They are uh, sliding women in the middle of their services. People, you know, instead of it being kind of ordered and proper in the way you go about it, uh, people are staying up in the middle of it, and they're just they're speaking in tongues like crazy. Nobody's interpreting. The, the, there's, they're proud of this fact, that there, there's a man there who is, uh, who, who's having sex with his father's wife, so probably a stepmom. But they're really proud that they're uh, tolerant of these issues. And so Paul's writing this letter to this church, and they're a mess of a church. And as he's writing this letter to the church, he's correcting a lot of these issues. And he comes to chapter 6, and he deals with a bunch of them all at once. Verse 9. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? The unrighteous. The unrighteous. Do not be deceived. Now he's going he's gonna to break out what is the unrighteous. What, who are the unrighteous? Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor those who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor the drunkards, nor the revilers, nor the swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Verse 11. And such were some of you. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. He says the unrighteous don't inherit God's kingdom. And then he breaks out who are the unrighteous. Sadly, too frequently, when, when we talk about the unrighteous inside of church, we said a little bit earlier, is the unpardonable sin is homosexuality. And, that, and that's in the list. That's in the list of people who won't inherit the kingdom of God. But you know who else is there? Sexually immoral. That porn addiction that you hide, that you say is not an issue, that you don't repent from, that's the root word of, the, of sexually immoral. Pornea. There it is. That's what it is. Uh, adulterers, so those who are literally cheating on their spouses. There it is. Cheat on your spouse, here it is. Same thing. You're, adulter you're being an adulterer. This also has the entire, the, the entire genre, world, whatever you want to call it, of 
of heterosexual sex outside of marriage. Right there. That's adultery. Nor those who practice homosexuality, nor thieves. Thieves, same, same level here. This is unrighteousness. This is what it is. Same level for as pornography addiction, as adultery, as homosexuality. Understand that. Also, the greedy. Got to get more money. Got to have more stuff. More money, more stuff. More money, more stuff. More money, more stuff. Guess what? Just as evil. Just as evil. Just as evil. Let's level the playing field here. Just as evil. This sin is sin. Drunkards. Have too many to drink last night? Is that why you're late to church today? <laughs> Revilers. You ever mock somebody? Swindlers. Any hedge fund managers here? If you are, please tie it. They don't inherit the kingdom of God. We can't elevate one sin above the others. They are all evil in the sight of a holy God. And what Paul says here that is beautiful, such were some of you. This is what you were. Hey, believer, this is what you were. Don't fall back into the garbage of thinking you are what you were. You aren't. You're something new. You're new in Jesus. Your identity is different now. What was old has passed away. What's new has come. You're a new creation in Jesus. What you were isn't what you are. So when our Savior dictates our identity... We set politics aside and we see people. When it's Jesus, when Jesus is the thing that matters to us, when it's Jesus that matters most to us, when, that, when he is it, when he's the core, and we set aside however we feel politically, and I see the person in front of me as someone that has been made in God's image, who is, who is a sinner just like me, who needs Jesus, who needs to be loved and cared for. I care for them. I spoke to a bunch of Southern Baptists yesterday at a conference, uh, and, I, and I had part of my talk was about, um, w- was about immigration. That's a, that's a topic we didn't even hit in this series. But that, I would have gotten a lot of emails on that guy. I said, I don't care what your politics are, but if an immigrant is among you, you need to help them. You need to love them. You need to care for them. Throw away the politics there's someone in need in front of you, Jesus is really clear about what you're supposed to do with someone in need. You help them. Someone in need among you, you help them. They ask for help, you help them. You do that. I don't care if they're illegal or not. You help them. When we see people, we see them as people. We see them as people made in God's image with dignity and and equality for all humanity in the middle of that thing. They are made in God's image. They're sinful like you and me. Number two. When our Savior dictates our identity, we recognize what we've been saved from. We recognize what we've been saved from. Uh, Are you familiar with Jesus, the famous guy in the gospel? I've said his name a lot. Uh, In in Matthew 18, he's he's talking, he he does this uh, parable of the talents, where this this guy, he's 10,000 talents. It's essentially like maybe, maybe think $100 million in that, in that world. This guy has borrowed $100 million from, from someone. He has not repaid it. Back then, that what you do if you don't repay your debt, you can't, you can't declare bankruptcy like Michael Scott. You, instead, you're, you're, you are going to be thrown into prison along with your family. Everybody's going to prison as a result of you defaulting on your loan. 
So the, the guy who lent, lent the money is, has the right to throw you in. He's going to throw you in. But the guy comes to him and says, hey, forgive me. Forgive me, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me. Please forgive me. And, and the guy who's, uh, you know, they don't call them lone puppies. And they don't call them lone kittens. They're called lone sharks, right? The lone shark comes back and says, uh, you don't owe anything. You don't need any more time to pay it off. I forgive the debt. We see them, we're like, yes. Then that same guy, the one who'd been forgiven so much, that one who'd been forgiven so much, uh, sees a guy who owes him a buck fifty. Says, hey, I need, I need my buck fifty back. I need it now. I need it now. I need it now. Give me my buck fifty back. I need it now. Guy says, I don't have it. Give me till next week. This is the Jason Crandall version of this, of this parable. <laughs> Give me till next week. Guy says, no, you're going to jail. And when we hear that story, when we read that story, when we look at that, that parable, well, what's supposed to happen to our minds and hearts is sh- complete shock. Because it's ridiculous that someone be forgiven $100 million and then hold somebody accountable to $1.25. $1.50, sorry. It's ridiculous. It's stupid. That would be beyond belief that anybody would ever do that. Exactly the point. And when you understand rightly the sin that you've been forgiven of, then you understand you're the one who's been forgiven $100 million. And the great God of all creation has done that for you through Jesus. And that for you to walk in unforgiveness, sir, to forget the forgiveness you've received is sinful and evil. If you've trusted in Jesus, you've been forgiven far more than you'll ever have to forgive in anyone else. It'd be best if we walked that way. Number three, when our Savior dictates our identity, we submit our whole selves to God. We submit our whole selves to God. One of the issues that we have to do is we have to bring ourselves progressively more and more underneath the complete sovereignty of who God is and what he says I am. That what we're going to do on a regular basis find sin in ourselves that is, that is counter to what God would say. And when we find ourselves counter to what God would say, what you and I need to do is <sighs> repent. That we need to repent. You don't need to somehow try to program it out of you or try to figure out a way to, to deal with it or, or, or clean up yourselves on your own or anything like that. What you need to do is you need to repent. We have to submit ourselves underneath who God says and what God says and, and understand that we are the ones who are wrong. You don't see everything rightly. Blaze, my middle son, would eat granola bars 24 hours a day. He would eat them for every single meal. Not even the good ones, just the cheap H-E-B ones. Not anything that's covered in extra chocolate or anything like that, just granola bars. He would do that all day long. It might be cheaper overall. What do you think, Allie? Maybe? No? She's, she's like, get done. It's time to be over. But we as his parents know he cannot live on a diet of granola bars because we see more than he sees. We understand that leafy green vegetables have a place in his life, that he needs to eat protein on a regular basis, that those things need to happen. Parents, you see better than your kids see. That's why over and over again, this God who we worship is called the Father because he sees better than you see. That's why over and over again, he's a, he's a shepherd and you're a sheep. Don't know if you know this about sheep. 
They're really dumb. Did Jason just call us dumb? No, God did. Don't get mad at me. They can't, they also have limited vision. They can't see more than 18 inches in front of their face. And you're called over and over again in the Bible, a sheep. And he's the shepherd. Because he sees better than you. Number four. When, when our Savior dictates our identity, we let Christ conform us to his image. If you were to look at the way John kind of summed up who Jesus was, in, in his prologue to his gospel, he says, uh, he says that he was filled with grace and truth. Grace is this unmerited favor where he just, just loves, just loves as you are, just loves you who you are. But he's also filled with this other quality, truth. And he's going to point out the problem, but he's going to love you through it. He's going to point out the sin, but he's going to love you in the middle of it. Well, how do we do that? Well, a little bit while later, Paul calls us to do the same thing. He says that what you and I are supposed to do is we're supposed to uh, walk in such a way, live in such a way, speak in such a way where, um, where we speak truth in love. Where, where, where we, we speak truth. We don't shy away from what the Bible says. We hold it dearly. But we love those who we're speaking to. And then John, he also wrote another book called 1 John. He says that we're not supposed to just, just love it in word. It's not, just, it's not just this thing where we say, hey, I love you. Love you, love you, love you. And love never has an action attached to it. It's that we're also supposed to love indeed. And so it's an active loving of someone else. It's an active caring for someone else. It's a, I'm speaking truth. But in the middle of me speaking truth is also, I'm not pushing back from the table on you. I'm with you. I love you. I'm not, I'm not going to say that, that, that the world or the sin that you are living in is okay because it's not, but I'm going to tell you that I love you as you are. Now, that is a hard road to walk, right? It's a narrow road to walk. It's almost like that's what God is constantly calling us to. That he wants us to not walk a broad road, but a narrow one. A narrow road that causes us to look differently than the rest of society. I wish that I could spend months on this subject because there is definitely months worth of material to go over. I would love to continue a conversation. If anybody wants to continue a conversation with me beyond this, beyond this point, beyond this day, because there is so much that I could not fit into this message before our kids' workers decide to kill me. We will do more series on this in the future just because this is going to be an issue that we see over and over again in our society. And we Christians have to learn to respond better than we have in the past. We've got to speak about this in grace and truth with love in our hearts for those who we disagree with. Because we're all separated from God. We're all sinners in need of a Savior. We're all sinners in need of a Savior. We're all sinners in need of a Savior. There's an expiration date on your life. One day, one day it will be over. The thing that matters at the end of your life is who have you trusted? Have you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ? Pray with me. Father God, thank you for your son Jesus who changed us from the inside out, who shows us our sin, speaks truth about our sin, and then extends grace to us as well. God, I pray with my whole heart 
that beyond anything else, if, if nothing else was heard today, that, that, that people understand that we are sinners separating God from God in need of Jesus. God, I pray if there's anyone here underneath the sound of my voice who does not know your son Jesus, has never trusted in him as Lord and Savior, God, I, I pray and I beg and I, and I ask you uh, to convict of sin and let them know the truth of your son, that they would be changed. Thank you for your son. It's in his name we pray, amen.